All right, guys, finally I am getting to these lectures. Uh, I wanted to thank you for being so uh, flexible um, and allowing me to get these out a little late. Sorry, I know it's probably frustrating um, not having the content out on time, so I do apologize and you know, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, I think you will like endocrine a lot better than respiratory, at least I do. Um, it's one of my probably favorite systems, uh, you know, up there, top three maybe. Uh, but it's pretty cool, hormones. Uh, this first lecture is going to be a lot of general principles. And this table from BRS, you should just, I don't know, print it out and like have it with you at all times. This is your your master list okay this is endocrine in a nutshell uh, you know you always need to be aware of where something comes from and you know what it does and that's why this tables you know such a good resource uh, we will go over some not all of these in detail uh, so I want to pick the I don't want to overwhelm you but I do want to pick the the hormones that are most commonly covered because of their relation to pathology. Uh, here's the second part of the list. So, I mean, you could probably even get away with bare minimum memorizing this list and you could get like, I don't know, at least half the questions right from just that, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but don't do that. Learn everything. <laughs> okay, so these, I included a lot of pictures because endocrine is a very visual system. If you get bogged down on the details uh, and lose track of where it's, things are happening anatomically, then things can get really hard. Uh, and I like this picture over on the left because uh, it's, like I said, very visual. It tells you where each of these hormones are acting. And the cool thing about the names is they a lot of them tell you exactly what they're doing. Uh, for example, TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, you know, it's coming from the anterior pituitary, going to the thyroid and stimulating it to make uh, thyroid hormones. <clears throat> so the the names can you know help keep help keep the memorization to a minimum because you don't need to memorize it if the name tells you exactly what it does. Uh, the endocrine system involves like a wide range of organs. Uh, there are some what's called like non-classical endocrine organs because they produce hormones but not in the same way that glands do. Uh, for instance, the heart is like a non-classical endocrine organ. Uh, there's the skin and I forget what else, uh, but yes, it involves a wide range of organ systems. Okay, so this lecture is going to be kind of over general principles, and uh, after that, I will attempt to cover the content, you know, by organ system, and just like focus uh, on like one thing at a time. Now, there's going to be a lot of times where I have to cover a pathway that involves, you know, three organs. So just keep that in mind regarding this second bullet here. Okay, so endocrine system, the glands that work together to maintain homeostasis, and that's really what uh, the all the layers and layers of regulation are about is that to maintain homeostasis. Um, a hormone is defined by a signaling molecule that is released into the bloodstream and modulates an aspect of physiology, typically at a distant location. So most times uh, when you think of hormones, it's gonna be something that's uh, secreted into the blood and then you know, travels through the blood and um, goes to a distant organ, binds a receptor at that organ, and then there's some intracellular signaling that occurs and the gene transcription is modified uh, to produce the effects of the hormone. Uh, the types of hormones, there are three main classes. Uh, peptide hormones, you also see uh, 
protein hormones. And the peptide is kind of known for sh being shorter in their chain of amino acids. And then protein hormones are for, the, for those that are longer, uh, maybe more complex structures. <clears throat> There's a pretty well understood synthesis mechanism. And they like this process. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. But for these peptide hormones, uh, they usually start out as, uh, as a pre-pro hormone in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and they're cleaved to pro hormone. And then they are sent in transport vesicles to the Golgi apparatus, where they're cleaved even more and modified. And then they are packaged into vesicles that go to the cell membrane. And then uh, exocytose out and are dumped into the bloodstream where they travel to their organ. So it's kind of a straightforward mechanism. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. So that's the first class. Uh, keep in mind uh, the examples of each of these uh, classes. You may see a question on that. Uh, oxytocin is a classic example of a peptide hormone, and there are a bunch. Uh, I think they're most hormones fall in this class. Uh, so when in doubt, it's either you know, protein or peptide hormone. <laughs> Amine hormones uh, all have in common that they're made from tyrosine. Okay? Uh, and norepinephrine is a classic example. Um, but and there's only a couple to know under this category of amine hormones. Uh, thyroid hormone, T, would in the form of T3 or T4, are also technically made from uh, tyrosine. But notice I put an asterisk. So you gotta keep this in mind, this is really important. Even though they're amine hormones, in almost every other aspect, they act like steroid hormones. Okay, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> that being said, we can move to steroid hormones. They all have in common, they're made from a cholesterol precursor. And these are easy to remember because they're the classic sex hormones, right? Testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. Um, there's some other examples you'll see later. But what else do I want to say? This is an important slide. Okay. And this is another way of putting it. Um, if you like text form better, I included this. Uh, and right here. When in doubt, it's probably a peptide hormone. All hormones of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, which is like, I don't know, 12 or something. Like a ton of hormones come from both of those places, and they are peptide hormones. Uh, like I said, amine hormones, thyroid hormone, and catecholamines. And catecholamines are just like norepinephrine, epinephrine. Um, there's is dopamine one? I don't know. There's another one. That's catecholamine, but the two big ones are norepinephrine, epinephrine. And then steroid hormones derive from cholesterol. And most hormones of the reproductive tract and adrenal cortex are steroid hormones. So this is a nice way to remember because it aligns with the anatomy. Like if you remember the organs that produce the hormones, you know, then you know they're probably going to be steroid hormones or peptide hormones. Uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, yes. This is very important because peptide hormones and amine hormones, and I'll put an asterisk next to thyroid hormone, because remember what I said last slide, okay? All peptide hormones and amine hormones, except thyroid hormone, are uh, water-soluble which means they can float freely in the plasma because of their um, hydro, hydrophilic. Yeah, hydrophilic. Um, hydrophilic nature, right? Water-loving, water-soluble. On the other hand, steroid hormones, and we talked about this in the first unit, are lipid soluble, which means, so what does that mean? That means, one, 
they need a carrier protein and two they can diffuse across the membrane freely right because they're lipophilic and the cell membrane's a lipid bilayer all right you guys remember that <coughs> okay now these two characteristics are also true of thyroid hormone okay and when i say need it's not all the time they, they use a carrier protein um, for most transport okay but then there is some free hormone as well but you know, don't worry about that as far as principles go they use a carrier protein okay and this is the classic classic example of synthesis of peptide hormone and they they like this because it incorporates different parts of the cell right so on our right here we have the blood all right then we have extracellular fluid you know in between the, the plasma and the cell and then we have on the left here the cell the cytoplasm here now <clears throat> number one you know remember the central dogma of molecular biology right dna to rna to protein all right so number one we're starting here the mrna level uh, the mrna binds to the ribosome right you guys probably remember all this stuff and then there's translation occurs into a protein uh, that first protein is called a pre-pro hormone uh, it uses a signal sequence to uh, migrate over to a certain part of the ER where uh, there are enzymes that chop off the sig signal sequence then it's called a pro hormone uh, transported to the Golgi uh, the Golgi mo further modifies it and it further cleaves off some more stuff and at that point we have active hormone and a peptide fragment left over. And it's definitely packaged into a secretory vesicle, right? Because you, you don't want active hormones floating around in the cell, especially if, um, for instance, if they're digestive hormones like uh, pepsin or lipase, things like that of the GI tract. You don't want them eating their own cell, right? So they're packaged into a vesicle and then they bud off the exocytosis and travel in the bloodstream to their target organ. Now, this is, you know, really important to remember because, and you guys may know this already, but the hormone effects are could be argued are not actually due to the hormone itself. They're due to recept its receptor, kind of like neuro, right? It's all about the receptor uh, because there's different receptor populations and different organs for a reason. And there can be upregulation, downregulation of different receptor types. And, you know, a hormone will never have an effect unless it binds to a receptor. And there are three requirements in order for a hormone to have an effect. There has to be high, high affinity interaction of the hormone and its receptor, high specificity, and signal amplification within the target cell. And all this means is your favorite cell signaling pathways, because these pathways need to be uh, amplified down to the point where you have the cell here, nucleus here, amplification of the signal needs to happen in order for a transcription factor to migrate to the nucleus and change gene transcription or gene expression. Now, this, um, I will admit, can be a little overwhelming because there are a ton of different pathways and different types of hormone receptors, okay? But we're going to briefly touch on it. You already know this, right? G protein coupled receptors. They're GS, GI, and GQ. And different hormone receptors uh, will act through you know, some of these mechanisms. Steroid hormone receptors. Now, because steroid hormones and thyroid hormones can freely diffuse across the cytoplasm, 
their receptors are actually located in the nucleus, right, or like the nuclear membrane. Uh, so they can immediately go and affect gene transcription <clears throat> without having to go through all the signal transduction, cell signaling stuff. Okay, even though there is still some, but that's a concept. Uh, some hormone receptors are coupled to a guanylyl cyclase. <coughs> and remember GS and GI, right? GS activates adenyl cyclase, GI inhibits adenyl cyclase. Guanylyl cyclase does the same thing as adenyl cyclase, but with cyclic GMP instead of cyclic AMP, right? So guanylyl cyclase will act via cyclic GMP. And that's how it's kind of similar to uh, GS and GI. Now, don't get these two classes of receptors confused because GPCRs are its own unique class. Uh, and all this class is saying is that there's a couple hormones that bind to a receptor that's linked to this enzyme specifically. Okay? So they're, they're different classes. Um, another class is known as receptor tyrosine kinases. We also see RTKs. And some buzzwords with this one is autophosphorylation. And all that means is that the receptor itself has the ability to phosphorylate itself or autophosphorylate. Uh, that's what differentiates it from tyrosine kinase associated receptors. We'll call them TCARs. Uh, because uh, this receptor is linked to a tyrosine kinase that can phosphorylate. Uh, <clears throat> this is a table uh, that says, you know, which hormones act via which mechanism. And this mechanism, you know, cyclic AMP would be either GS or GI. Um, IP3 would be GQ right? Uh, steroid hormone. So all these, right, are classic derived from cholesterol uh, steroid hormones. Glucocorticoids like cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, aldosterone, vitamin D, and then there's thyroid hormone, which remember technically is an amine hormone, but it acts like a steroid hormone. And then over here, I put a little dash aligned here because insulin and IGF act on a receptor tyrosine kinase, which is a receptor that can phosphorylate itself and to activate, uh, activate the cell signaling pathway. And then growth hormone and prolactin act via uh, binding a receptor that is um, associated to a tyrosine kinase. And then the cyclic GMP me mechanism, A and P nitric oxide. Uh, don't, don't get too overwhelmed with this. Um, I will highlight one of these if, you know, I think it's important to ask about. Uh, Insulin is really important because they think it's really important for you to know that insulin binds receptors to tyrosine kinase. Um, and you may see some of these questions in the future, but I don't know that I'm going to get that detailed uh, on the test. If I do ask something, it'll be insulin or steroid hormone mechanism. Okay. This is a table from first aid. So these are the classic mnemonics. Um, it, for the, that people use to memorize which hormones act via which signaling pathways. And I know you guys are probably thinking, what the heck, this is like so detailed. Uh, but the if you plan on taking the USMLE, the USMLE is increasingly becoming more molecular biology oriented in their questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the COMLEX, you may be less likely to see a molecular biology question, but 
of USMLE, you know, will ask these types of questions. So um, first aid has a lot of good mnemonics uh, about, you know, which hormones bind which receptors. So this is something I didn't talk about, but this is important. Uh, you'll see this pathway in immunology. Okay, so it's another place you see it because a lot of cytokines act via the jack stat pathway. Um, prolactin, growth hormone, also act via that pathway. Uh, <clears throat> but if you can keep in mind like, some common themes, and it's easy to remember, like insulin is an anabolic hormone, right? Uh, and growth factors are also anabolic. So uh, that's why I said think growth factors. Yeah, I mean, don't get hung up on this stuff. I'm just including it for your reference. Uh, it's good to get to see it because you will see this stuff again. Now, I found this on Google Images, like most things, <laughs> but this per I like how this person remembered stuff because that's how I like to remember stuff. I like to like circle letters that were the same. So, oh, well, this is pretty good. Um, like cyclic AMP is a bunch of A's, adenyl cyclase, cyclic AMP, protein kinase A. Um, the GQ pathway, phospholipase base C, increase in calcium, protein kinase C activation. Uh, the cyclic GMP pathway is a bunch of G's, right? Guanylocyclase, cyclic GMP, protein kinase G. So this is like a really, really solid, solid way to remember the uh, to intracellular pathways and it's a good way to simplify things and not get hung up in the details, like me. <laughs> uh, this MAPK pathway is referring to uh, tyrosine kinase receptor, or receptor tyrosine kinases. And the buzzwords, because you'll see these again, autophosphorylation and activation of MAP kinase. And all that means is MAPK is just something that um, does some phosphorylation and causes a certain intracellular signaling pathway to take place, and that's related to growth factors. Uh, you'll also see, so the M in MAP kinase actually stands for mitogen, and a mitogen is anything that advances the cell cycle, basically, and causes growth. Okay, so when it comes to modulation of hormones and regulation, it is literally never ending. It's like the regulation of DNA transcription. I mean, it's like ridiculous. Uh, hormone release can be caused or impacted by just about everything. Nerve stimuli, blood glucose levels, obviously. Ion levels like sodium um, and its own levels. Because <clears throat> then if its own levels get too, gets too high, it'll go and cause negative feedback to slow down the production, right? Positive feedback is a lot rarer. Classic example that you probably already know that you'll see again is oxytocin during labor uh, is a feed forward mechanism. And that's for contraction of the, uh, of the uterus to, uh, to, you know, to give birth. Uh, most the most common you know, mechanism you'll study when it comes to hormone regulation is negative feedback, and we'll talk about that. There, but keep in mind, there can also be cha change in the hormone receptor populations, like upregulation, downregulation, um, gene expression changes, carrier proteins, like I said, steroid hormones and thyroid hormones can affect the uh, regulation of hormones, et cetera, et cetera. So this just Keep in mind the, um, this is kind of why I like endocrine. It's just like very complex. <laughs> All right, so these will probably be similar to what you'll see on the test. Uh, based on your knowledge of hormones, which of the following will be transported in the plasma by being bound to a binding protein. And this is getting at that water-soluble, lipid-soluble concept. So... 
oxygen, oxytocin, ADH, epinephrine are all water soluble. Uh, testosterone is a steroid hormone derived from cholesterol, so it's lipid soluble, which means it, it uses a uh, uh, binding protein or a carrier protein in the plasma. Okay, a particular hormone is able to control the function only of its target tissues or target tissue. This is because, and the answer here, so what did I say like the most important thing that determines a hormone's effect was? Now you should be thinking it's receptor, right? So the answer is E. Each hormone must interact with its specific receptors, which are only found on its target tissues, and that's what makes the actions of these hormones so classic, right, and well-known. Because thyroid-stimulating hormone can only find its receptor in the thyroid gland, right? Uh, <clears throat> which of the following hormones mediate their actions via an intrinsic phosphorylation mechanism? Remember, autophosphorylation followed by MAPK signaling, and the answer is insulin. Okay. I think that's it. Okay, so we're going to stop there for this lecture. Sorry if I rambled a lot. Um, like I said, don't get hung up in the details. A lot of the, a lot of the like annoying stuff that I included like all that, those tables of the signaling pathways, uh, I'm including not because I plan on like testing the crap out of you guys, uh, but because you'll see it again. And, you know, the knowledge of science is getting to a point, kind of a ridiculous point, and where the, the board questions are asking very, very complex molecular biology questions, kind of unfairly, in my opinion. But Nonetheless, it is good to be prepared and be exposed to the, the details.